Well, hey, good to see everyone, your smiling faces. I say that in case you're not smiling to remind you to smile, because I have to look at you for the next 55, 60 minutes. <laughs> Just kidding. My name's Chase. We're in a series called Judges, walking through the book of Judges, and, and I'm growing more and more in love with the Old Testament. Uh, if you were here a few weeks back, I, I didn't really love it growing up, and I'm growing more and more in love. And one of my favorite things about the Old Testament is, is it does a good job of teaching us about who God is. You know, the same God of Abraham and Sarah, the same God of, of Noah and Moses and, and Isaac, the same God of, of Gideon is the same God that we serve today. And we can look back at these stories from the Old Testament and we can see how God interacts with them then and know that he can interact and do some similar things in our life here today. And so I love learning about who God is and then how they respond to that. And then we can see how we can do the same today. So I'm really excited. Uh, we're in chapter 7. What we're going to do today is I want to just share with you, teach you three things about God from this story. We're continuing to look at the book of Judges, Gideon's story. My, my boy G-Man is what I call him, Gideon, because I have a son named Gideon. I call my son G-Man. So when I talk about Gideon today, I'm going to call him G-Man. Are you okay with that? Good. Okay. So my boy G-Man, uh, Gideon, he's 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 one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament and favorite guys to study. And, and we're going to learn who God is, and then we're going to learn how Gideon respond, and hopefully you and I can learn to respond in a similar way and see it bless our life. <laughs> so the 915 crowd, I made them say some things this, this morning to encourage them because they were not awake. And, and I can tell by the way you sang, you guys are at least more awake. But listen, when I preach, I need to make sure that you are knowing what's going on, okay? Because I'm going to talk a lot today, and I'm going to talk real fast. And so could you just with me, can you just say, we're ready? We're ready. No, I'm not going to make you say it again. I think you're actually ready. All right, all right, here we go. Let's dive right in um, to Judges chapter 7. We're going to start right at the beginning. If you weren't here last week or you don't know the story, God calls this man named Gideon um, to, to raise up the Israelites' army because they are in oppression from the Midianites. The Midianites have, have oppressed them for seven years, are starving them, and God says, we're going to fight them, and I'm going to use you, Gideon, to rescue Israel, Israel, and I'm going to use you to fight this battle. And Gideon, although hesitant and a little afraid, he says, okay. And so he gathers an army, and that's the end of chapter 6. He's got an army ready to go, and here we dive right into chapter 7. It says this, so Jerubbabel, that's Gideon, and if you remember from last week, he got a nickname. His name's Gideon, but they named, gave him a nickname, Jerubbabel, which means Baal butt kicker, okay? It's because at the end of the story, uh, Gideon tore down Baal's uh, altar, and they gave him this nickname because they said, well, if, if Baal's upset about it, this God, small g, if he's upset that Gideon did this, he can contend for himself. And since Baal's not real, he didn't do anything, and they're like, let's give him a nickname, Baal Butt Kicker. All right, so that's what it means. Um, and, and Gideon and his army, they get up early, and they went as far as the spring of Herod, and the armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. Now the Lord said to Gideon, hey, you have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, I want you to tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave the mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring, and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. So when Gideon took the warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup the water in their hand and lap it up like a dog. In the other group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Now only 300 men drank with their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. And the Lord told Gideon, with these 300, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So Gideon collected the provisions and the ram's horns of the other warriors, sent them home, but kept the 300 men with him. If you don't know this about me, I am no military expert. I'm not very wise in that area. But even I can tell that this seems like a really bad idea. So if you continue to read in chapter 8, you'll find out that there was 135,000 Midianites and allies. They had 135,000 men strong. That's a lot. Gideon gathered an army and they had 35,000. If you, 32,000, do the math. I did it backwards. 32,000 men. And he's going, okay, this is good. And God comes to him and he says, hey, I, I want to do something. We need to shrink your army. Gideon's going, well, there's 135,000 and I have 32,000. I don't know if you know what you're doing. 
First thing I want to teach you about God, you're not going to like this at first, but just go with me, okay? It gets, it'll get better. God is weird. Now, don't look at me weird because I called God weird because it's okay, all right? When I told my, actually, my wife was looking over my notes last night, and uh, she comes to this point, and we're sitting next to each other on the couch, and she leans over, and she goes, you're going to call God weird, huh? I said, yeah, I'm going to call God weird. Huh. I said, did you read the rest of my notes? She goes, yeah. I said, and it still doesn't make sense. <laughs> and she goes, I, mean, I don't know, do what you got to do, you know? So she's, she wasn't a fan at first, but she listened to the first service, and she said it worked. So, all right. so just follow with me here. As you look up the word weird in the dictionary, you're going to find this. Weird means strange, odd, peculiar, bizarre, different, or uncanny. I like that one especially if you say it like that, uncanny, different, bizarre, odd, strange. Can we be honest? God's different. Some of his ways are a little strange. Dare I say peculiar or uncanny. And actually, it's, don't just take my word. In Isaiah 55, God says it this way, for my thoughts are not like your thoughts. Neither are your ways like my ways, says the Lord. He says, I'm different. I don't think like you think, and I don't do things like you would do things. And when you read through the Bible, you're going to find out that there's a lot of things that God chooses to do and ways that he does it, and you're going to go, that's not how I would do it. And in just the story, just the first part I just read to you, can we all agree that that's weird? If you don't think that what I just read was weird, you're weird. I mean, that, this is really strange. There's 135,000. Gideon has 32,000. He goes to God and says, hey, this is going to be great. And God says, you have too many men. And he says, that's hilarious, God. Are you going to give me some more, like angels or something? God says, no, we got we to take some away. So he says, first, everyone who is afraid can go home. And it'd be like me standing up here and Gideon. And he says, all right, guys, everyone who's scared right now, you can just go home. And this entire group leaves. <laughs> They just run away. Now, some may say that's a brilliant military strategy because these are scaredy cats. And listen, if we start fighting and the scaredy cats get scared while we're fighting, they're going to run home and some of you guys are going to join them because fear is contagious. So that kind of makes sense, right? That's not the worst idea in the world, but all of a sudden now he's only got 10,000 men. So Gideon's going, all right, we got 10,000 men and you guys, we're brave. We're, we're brave warriors. And God says, nope, still too many. Okay, so now what? God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down to the stream, and we're going to have them drink, and I'm going to do a test. And so they says, they go down to the stream, and he says, some of them bend down, and they get down in the stream, and they scoop up the water with their hands, and they start licking it like dogs. God says, I want those guys. <laughs> yeah. He says, others, they're going to go down in the stream, and they're going to get on all fours, and they're going to put their head in the stream, and they're just going to go drink that way i don't want those guys so he sends those guys home there's only 300 left the dog fighters the dog i mean this is this is who he chooses that's weird now you can make a case for sending home the scaredy cats some people try to make a case for this like why he chose those 300 i'm just here to tell you god didn't choose these 300 because they were now the brave fighters that he didn't choose the dog fighters because they were, he, this is just weird. There's a reason why God does some weird things, and I want, I want to share with you a few reasons why I think God is doing some of this stuff that seems strange and odd and different. He narrows it from 32,000 to 300. It's not exactly how you or I would have gone into battle that day. And now all of a sudden, what was once a lopsided battle, 32,000 to 135, is now an extremely impossible, ridiculous idea that these 300 men, are going to go up against 135,000. God starts to stack all the cards against them. He starts to set up this scenario that doesn't look very good. But he tells us why. And I think it's important that we not understand that God is weird, and that's not a bad thing, but we understand why God does some weird things. So in, in the very beginning, it says this, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. If I let you all fight the Midianites... The Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves on their own strength. I see two reasons why, why God does this weird thing, particularly in this story. The first is God says, I 
want the glory. I, I deserve the glory. I'm doing this so that they praise me and not themselves. Because he knew that even if 32,000 of them went and started fighting, they would walk back to their camps and go, did you see how many men that I killed? Huh, 32,000 of us, how many did you get? Oh, man, I was killing it out there, like literally killing it out there. Like it was, oh, dude, you were on fire. I saw you were like, whoosh, rah, it was awesome. They would have walked back and said, listen up, Israel, we did it. We defeated them. We are mighty warriors. But now there's only 300 of them. And, and God says, listen, if they go back and they, and they think and remember this story the wrong way, they're going to think that they are the ones who did this. But I am the one who's going to give you victory. This is not about their glory. It's about my glory. You and I were created to glorify God. You and I were created to glorify God. Isaiah 43, God says this, bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my... Oh, I didn't tell you you were going to have to read, so hang on. I have made them for my... Yeah, it was I who created them. I made them for my glory. God created us and made us for his glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Your life and my life is meant to be lived in a way that gives God glory in everything. It's what we were created for. It's why he made us to give him glory. If you study church history or you study the traditions of, of the past, you'll, you'll hear these words called catechism. And one of the old catechisms says this, that the chief end of all man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The purpose of your life, the end of it all, the chief end of all of us is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why we exist. And so sometimes the way in which God does things is, is a little bit strange. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit weird. It's so he can get the glory. It's so that we can point praise back to him and not to ourselves. The world says, glorify yourself, live for you. And when you do something good, let people know about it. But God says, no, I, I created you to glorify me. We're to be a little bit differently. God also, we're to be differently? That's not right. We're to be different. How about that? God's ways are also weird because they keep us dependent on him. Think about 300 men. They know they're going up against 135,000, and then it, it's ridiculous. They have to be dependent on God. If God took our army and shrunk it, he better go out there and do something awesome. God does weird things sometimes and makes us live weirdly because it causes us to depend on him. We give him glory when this happens, but we're also very dependent on him. Because if we can do it our own way, if, if we're the ones who are strong enough, smart enough, if we've achieved it on our own, then we don't lean on God. We don't trust in him. We think, I got this. I can do it myself. But if you're a follower of Christ in the room today, meaning you, you believe in Jesus, you claim to be a Christian, guess what? That's not how we live. We live dependent on God. One of the most famous Proverbs says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. We trust God with our entire life we don't lean on our own strength or lean on our own understanding or lean on our own charisma. We, we trust in him and lean on him and depend on him. And there are times where God strips things away from us, just like he did with the army here, where he, where he makes things more difficult, or at least it seems that way. And what he wants us to get from that is that we need to be fully dependent on him. I'll tell you a story. Um, if... It's part of my journey of being a pastor. I, uh, eight years ago, I wasn't a pastor. I, I was working on an ambulance and really knew I needed to be a pastor, and, but I didn't have the education. I didn't have any experience. I didn't even have a resume. I didn't even know how to write a resume. And I literally got a call, not from the Lord, but from a person in South Dakota. And they called me. They said, hey, you want to be a pastor? And I'm like, <laughs> yes. I said, uh, I don't have a degree. I don't have the education. I don't have uh, any experience. I don't even know how to be a pastor. I really want to be one, though. And I said, and I don't have a resume. He said, that's okay. Do you love Jesus? I was like, yeah, okay. And so anyway, he hired me. It was awesome. And that's how my journey began. And I can tell you the story of how my journey began here, which was just as unqualified and ridiculous now. And I tricked all of you guys, too. So, um, <laughs> But in that, in that story, I, I get invited out to South Dakota, and, and we, we accept this job, and we put our house up for sale. And, and the problem is we had just bought our house like within the last year, so we needed to make a certain amount because we would just been married. And if you know, if you, right when you get married, you're normally just poor. Like it just is life, right? And that's what we were. And so we're like, we got to make a certain amount before we can get it. So we get a realtor in there, and I said, it's got to be this amount. And they said, that's too much. And I said, well... 
go for it. That's why we're hiring you. And uh, so we, he tells me it's too much. We put a for sale sign in our front yard. And the very same time we put a for sale sign in our front yard, they decide, the city decides that this is the right time to start construction on our road. And they put a giant um, tractor truck piece of equipment with some wheels on it in front of our for sale sign. And they, they park it right in front of it. And then they say, oh, yeah, we're going to start, and we're going to take out 10 feet of your front yard, and we're going to work on the next 10 feet of your front yard, and we're going to take this nice two-lane road, and we're going to turn it into a four-lane road with a, a center divider, too. If you want to sell your house, this is not the best way to start. But as we look back, it's, me and my wife love looking back on this. It's one of those stories, it's one of those moments of our life where we look back and say, we did not sell our house. Fact. Because we were like, God, you... You did tell us to do this, right? Like, we are following you. This is what you want from us. And he's like, yeah, I, I got you. But if you pick the right price and you prettied up your house perfectly and got the right realtor, guess who you're going to think sold your house? You. And it's not you. It was me. So we look back. God sold that house for the price that I wanted with construction happening. They bought the house, and for the next, like, six months, they dealt with people taking apart their front yards. <laughs> It was amazing. And we look back and we know that God is the only one who sold that house. God gets the glory. And we had to fully depend on him because there was nothing we could do. I could not move the truck. I could not stop the construction. Only God was the one who did it. So he gets the glory and we were fully dependent on God. And we can just look back. What I see is God do some weird things sometimes in our life. He works in some weird ways. But look what Gideon does. Gideon trusts God and obeys him. If you were here last week, you could have defined Gideon as the man who asked lots of questions. Last week, chapter 6, Gideon's like, are you sure you're God? Let me test that. And then later at the very end, he says, I know you've called me and you've already proven it, but can I just try one more test? And he gives the fleece test. And he says, actually, one's not good enough. Can you do it again? But when God tells him to take 32,000 men and send 22,000 home and then pick the 300 dog drinkers, he just says, okay. He just trusts him and obeys him. And I think if you and I, how we respond to how the, the weirdness of how God works sometimes, what we need to do in our life, we need to trust him and obey him. It doesn't look like the way we would want it to look. It doesn't seem like this is the best option, and we need to follow God and trust him and obey him. God's ways are weird, and, and I think there's one other thing I want to talk about this. Man, when I was working on this part of the message, I was just getting fired up, and I was... I was walking around the lobby. No one was here that day, thankfully. And I'm walking around the lobby preaching to myself. I'm weird, okay. <laughs> I was walking around the lobby preaching to myself. I was getting really excited about this because I've been reading through the Old Testament. I'm, I'm in that part of the Bible right now. And, and I realized all of God's ways are so weird. I mean, look at some of the Old Testament and how he handles his business. And here's what I learned. That, that God does it not just so that he gets glory and he does it so that we're dependent on him, but he does it because it sets us apart from the rest of the world. When we follow after the way God wants us to live, it makes us different from the world around us. It makes us strange, unique, odd, peculiar, yeah. weird, yeah. uncanny. Take a look at this. Old Testament laws. Here's a couple of them. Um, the rest of the world at this time just worships lots of different gods. Sun god, stars god, land god, water god. You get one, the one true god. Oh, okay, we, we can do that. And then he says, oh, and, and by the way... Um, don't lie. They're like, but it's not that big a deal to lie, right? Like, no, I, it, your word matters. It matters what you say and, and how you live. And he says, actually, and, and the way you work, there's seven days a week, but I only want you to work six. And as the rest of the entire universe is working every day around you to make crops and to build things and do their business, I want you to work six. I want you to rest on the seventh. I want you to give that day as a day of honor and, and worship to me. And I'm going to bless those six days so that the world around you sees you work for six, rest for one, and I'm going to do more with your crops and more with your livestock and more with what you do on those six days than the seventh. And they're going to pay attention. That's strange. As you jump into the New Testament and you keep reading about God and the way that we're called to live, he says, I want you to do marriage totally different from the world. The world says, you know what? Just go around, test things out, find a lot of girls, just do what you got to do. And then when you're ready to settle down, after you've had your fun, pick one and then, and then get married. And then, you know, if it doesn't work out, just, just 
say goodbye and try it again next time. And if it doesn't work out, just, you know, it's not a big deal. It's not a real commitment. It just kind of is. And, and just see what happens. That's how the world says to do relationships and marriage. But God says, no, 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 I want you to be faithful to one. And in that faithfulness, here's what I want you to do. Even when it's hard, I want you to love them. Even when your husband is not deserving of your love, I want you to love him. Even when your wife doesn't deserve or earn your love, I want you to love them with unconditional love. I want you to sacrificially love them. I want you to submit to one another because two of you are becoming one flesh and you're in this together and you become a team. I want you to stick it out. I want you to love each other even when it's not easy. That's different. That's different. It says, listen, how you handle relationships, how you handle parenting should look differently. How you talk should look differently. How you work, you don't just work for the man. When you work, think of like you're working for me. Everything you do for the glory of God. If I haven't hurt your feelings yet, how about this one? Um, money. You know what really makes sense? When you get 100% of your money, I want you to bring it in. I want you to take 10% and give it to the Lord and then only work off of 90 let me give you guys a secret. That's not the best strategy for finances. I've earned 100%. I've earned all this money. We'll give part of it away first before you work with the rest. I promise you, that's weird. That's different. That's, that's peculiar. But God says, listen, I want you to know something. I want you to depend on me. And I'm going to take that 10%. And I'm going to give you 90%. And I'm going to bless the 90%. I can do more with 90% than you can do with 100 by yourself anyway. I'm going to make it go further. I'm going to make it last longer. I'm going to make it better. That's odd. Some of you are going, why did the pastor talk about money today? That's all they ever talk about, those pastors. Soon he's going to say the word politics. Churches don't talk about politics. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to talk about politics. God does some weird things, and his way of life is a little bit different, but it causes us to depend on him and give him glory, and it sets us apart from those around us. So when people look at your life, they say, that's weird, and you say, yep, but it's real, and it works, and it's worth doing. Now, I left out one part of the definition of weird, and some of you aren't going to believe this, but you can Google it yourself because that's where I go for all of my research is Google. Um, if you go to Google.com and type in the word weird and definition, you'll find that it says this. Supernatural, out of this world, and extraordinary. Oh, now you're saying, I think I like how you're describing God. How would I describe God to you? I think he's supernatural. He is out of this world. He is extraordinary. You can't define him. You don't need to defend him. He's bigger than you. He's better than you. He's greater than you. His ways are so different from yours. He's weird. He's extraordinary. And I want to call some of us today to be a little bit weird. Now, not for the sake of being weird. Some of us do that on our own. Don't just be weird to be weird, but maybe, maybe, just maybe, if we started living the way God would have us to live, people around us would look and say, that seems odd, peculiar, uncanny, seems extraordinary. And I believe it is. And so God is weird. It should cause us to trust and obey him. Let, let's keep reading. I got really excited about that part. We're going to fly through this next part as we get into some really cool stuff. This part's really hilarious. The, the actual battle part we're going to get to in like two minutes is Super crazy. I love it. All right, here we go. Next part. So the Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. Check. That night the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down to the Midianite camp, for I have given you victory over them. But if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura, listen to the Midianites, what are they are saying, and you'll be greatly encouraged. Then you, will eagerly, then you will be eager to attack. So Gideon took Pura, and they went down to the edge of the enemy camp. The armies of Midian and Am Amalek and the people of the east had settled in the valley like swarm of locusts. Their camels were like grains of sand on the seashore, too many to count. So Gideon crept up just as a man was telling a companion about his dream. The man said, I had this dream. And in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. Cool. <laughs> his companion answered, oh, <laughs> your dream can only mean one thing. There's no other interpretation, just this one. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over Midian and all of its allies. That's what that meant. And when he heard the dream and its interpretation, Gideon bowed in worship before the Lord. I want to show you what God is doing here. 
because you might miss it. You might think that that's part you just kind of scrape over. That was weird. Why did he talk about bread and knocking over a tent and dreams? But you got to understand here's what God's doing. As Gideon is trusting God and obeying God, God is reassuring Gideon that he's got his back. God is letting Gideon know that he is good. God is good. Sometimes in our life we, we need assurance because we're, un, we're unsure. That's why you get assurance because you're unsure. If it, is this really what God is calling me to do? Is this really the step I'm supposed to take? Should I really make this decision? I, I want to make sure, God. And we saw that last week. Gideon questioned God. He's asking questions. Are you sure? Are you sure? And God was faithful to answer. Did you see that? Remember that last week? He answered every time. But sometimes we, we might be too afraid to ask again. We might be scared to death inside, but we're not saying anything. And God still comes alongside us and says, hey, you got this. Let me assure you. Let me show you that I am good. And, and I see God showing his goodness to Gideon in this little section in three quick ways. Uh, first, he gives them assurance through his spoken word. He says, Gideon, I have given you victory over them. He just speaks to him. He just, he just shares a word with him and says, Gideon, I want you to know, hey, 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 you're not asking, but, but, but I want you to know, you're going to win. I got this. I, I'm going to work through you. It's going to be amazing. And then what you see happen is, is he says, Gideon, if you're afraid, <laughs> I don't know if you are, but if you're afraid, and Gideon's like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your servant. I want you to slide down to the camp, sneak up, and I want you to see what they're saying, and we'll go from there. Then you'll have courage. Gideon's like, Okay. And it says that Gideon crept up. And at just the right time, he hears a man talking about his dream. God put Gideon in the right place at the right time to hear exactly what he needed to hear so that he would go and do what God had called him to do. Here's what happened. I, I love this. This is so silly. It's so strange. At just the right time, Gideon hears this dream. Here's the dream. Uh, I saw a loaf of bread, barley bread, fall down the hill. Uh, it knocked over a tent, knocked it flat. You know what that means? Only one thing. That Gideon, he's going to destroy us all. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's what happened. <laughs> that's exactly, I mean, maybe not exactly. I'm pretty close. It's hilarious. If, if you do a little study, you'll see some people are like, well, barley bread was for the poor people and insignificant. And so it's funny because he's like, <laughs> he's, gonna get this. he's like comparing this poor bread, this little loaf, this tiny little guy to Gideon. And Gideon gets encouraged by this. This is the best. It's like you got your Detroit Lions. They're like, oh, we're the Lions. You know, football season starting. You got MSU Spartans. And then you have the Israelites, loaves of bread. <laughs> what? And Gideon's like, yeah, that's me. I'm insignificant little loaf of bread. And that's what that, okay. God puts him just at the right time to hear exactly what he needs, the right place, the right time to hear everything he needs. And then this, this last little thing I saw, and it's just me, I feel like I was saying this, and maybe it's a little stretch, but, but God wanted to show Gideon that he's not alone, that he doesn't have to face this battle alone, that he doesn't have to be afraid all by himself. And so he tells him to take Pura, his, his servant, with him. I always think of Winnie the Pooh for some reason. I don't know why. That just popped in my head. I shouldn't have said that. But um, I just think, like, you know, like, who better to go with you when you're fearful and scared than Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, lovely, la da 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 Anyway, that was first service. That was weird. Yeah. <laughs> that was weird. First service did not get that one. Um, <laughs> but I just think he, he gave him someone to go with him. He says, I, I, I know you're afraid. I want you to go see this, but you don't have to go through it alone. Here's what I think. You and I get to experience similar things with God. God is good, and sometimes as, as we're, we need that assurance in our life, sometimes he shows up and speaks through his word. If you've ever read, we call this the word of God, the Bible, if you ever do any sort of reading with it, or maybe you have the app on your phone, you probably had moments in, in your life where you picked up the phone or opened up the Bible, you started reading, and that one verse just jumped off the page, and it was like God was slapped. Sometimes he slaps me with verses. Maybe for you guys, he just gently puts it in front of your eyes like this, and you just needed that verse. It was the exact thing you needed to hear. It was the encouragement you needed, the comfort you needed. It was the conviction that you needed. Anybody ever had that happen to them? 
where, where, where word from God through, through his word just spoke to you at the right time. It's what you needed to hear. That's what he did with Gideon, and he does that with us to assure us that he's good. That's what we needed. There's also times in our life, I, I can tell you I've experienced these moments where, like, I just happen to run into the right person at the right time. We just happen to be at the right place to experience this thing, to hear this thing, to hear that song on the radio. I just happened to turn it on just at the right time. I was like, I needed that, God. Thank you. You ever been there where you just right place, right time where God says, I got you. And you heard exactly what you needed to hear. You experienced exactly what you needed to give you more comfort, to give you more peace, or to give you encouragement to keep going. And, and also just from this, just think like that God doesn't want us to go through life alone. And there's so many of us facing battles. I really think every one of us is facing some sort of battle right now. Maybe it's big, maybe it's small. Maybe you don't even realize it's a battle at all. That rhymed and I liked it. I'm not tall. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's just nice to know that we're not alone. Like we were not meant to face the struggles and battles and, and, and problems of our life by ourselves. And I think God gives us people in our life to come alongside of us, to give us the right word of encouragement, to come alongside of us and, and just be there for us as we're fighting these battles. The bottom line is this, that God is good. And how does Gideon respond? He worships. Check it out, the very last line. And when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship before the Lord. Right there on the side of the camp. There are 135,000 warriors, and what does Gideon do? He says, hang on one second. Man, God, you're good. Thank you. Chapter 6 of Judges. That's the Bible app. I, that's what I read. I listened to that this morning. He's good. And Gideon what? He worshiped. He worshiped. And that's what the goodness of God should lead us to do in our lives, to worship him. Because he is so worthy of our worship. Let, let's, let's round this out. Let's close this out. Let's see the battle. Are you ready? Everybody say, I'm ready for the battle. Ready for the battle. Or say, woo. Either one works. All right, here we go. So when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down before the Lord in worship. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and he shouted, get up, for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. He divided the 300 men into three groups. He gave each man a ram's horn, a clay jar, and a torch. Then he said, keep your eyes on me, and when I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horn, blow your horn too, all around the entire camp, and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Now it was just after midnight when the changing of the guard, in the, uh, when the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the hundred men reached the edge of the Midianite camp, suddenly they blew their ram's horn, broke their clay jars. All three of the groups blew their ram's horns, broken the clay jars. <laughs> When he, they held the blazing torches in their left hand and the horns in their right hands, and they all shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as the Midianites rushed around in panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. <laughs> it's my favorite battle scene in the entire Bible. One, because Gideon's leading it. Two, because it's impossible and super weird. Now, we don't know if God told Gideon the battle strategy or if Gideon came up with it on his own. All we know is that it is weird. Okay, this is the strangest way to fight a battle. Here's what Gideon does. Let me explain it to you guys over here because they, they weren't really paying attention earlier. So um, here's what happens. Gideon says, all right, we got 300 warriors. We're going to break into three, three groups, 100, 100, 100. Okay, like we didn't already have enough. Let's split up, okay. Um, and uh, we're going to come get your weapons, okay. So everybody come get your weapons. They're all like, all right, I want a sword, I want a shield, and I want a spear. Because if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. And they walk up, and Gideon's like, all right, weapons, line up. Here we go. You get a ram's horn, a clay jar, and a torch. Sword, a spear. No swords. Yep. No spears? Nope. Cool. Cool. All right. So I got my torch with a clay jar around it, and I got my ram's horn and he says I want you to do as I do so they surround the camp now you got to understand this this is really cool it's actually really brilliant um, so it's about midnight so they're all sleeping okay they get to the edge of the camp they surround it it's about midnight it's a changing of the guard that means there are there are Midianite warriors coming back into the camp because they were outside the camp watching for people like the Israelites to show up and they missed it okay so they're coming back into the camp tired they've been watching guard for a while everyone else is inside the camp sleeping and all of a sudden they hear this and then light shines all around them 
They're surrounded by light. And they hear this. I just got to tell you what they said. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. You know why that's funny? They don't have a sword. <laughs> like maybe they have it on their side, but they're not going to use a sword anyway. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. It's like, what? I love that. This is clever in my mind. So they're surrounding this camp. Light shine bright. They wake up to this clanging noise and this trumpet, and they hear them say, a sword for the Lord, and they wake up, and they just grab their sword, and they're like, it must be the Israelites, and they rush out, and they start fighting all the people that are coming in, which is who? Themselves. This is the greatest battle against themselves. Now, if you keep reading, you'll find out that only 15,000 were left after this. That means 120,000 men killed each other. They they played against each other and they lost. <laughs> they destroyed themselves. It said that when they blew the ram's horn, the Lord caused the warriors to fight. The Lord gave them victory. And you know what Gideon did and the Israelites did? They sat back with a torch and watched it all. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, that's going to hurt. The Lord fought for them that day. The Lord defeated the army. Here's what I want you to get. God might be weird. He's really, really good. And he is always faithful. God called Gideon from the very beginning as he was hiding in his wine press because he was scared. God told him, hey, you mighty warrior, I'm going to use you to rescue Israel. I'm going to give you victory. I'm going to save my people. And he continued to be faithful to his promise. All along the way, assuring Gideon that this is going to happen, telling him that this is how it's going to go. God was faithful to Gideon. We see it for the next 40 years. If you fast forward to the end of chapter 8, it says this. This is the story of how the people of Israel defeated Midian, which never recovered. Throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 years, there was peace in the land. God was faithful to Gideon and Israel. So I just want to close and wrap up by saying this. How we respond to God's faithfulness in our life is we keep trusting him. And we keep obeying him. And we keep worshiping him. Because he's worthy. Because he's faithful. He, he will never let us down. I love the song we sang right before this. He has never failed me yet. And he's not going to. He's a good God. A faithful God. And I believe if we keep trusting and obeying and keep worshiping, he will lead us to keep doing good things and enjoying this wonderful life. For the next 40 years, as Israel trusted him, he obeyed. As they obeyed and followed him, he, he was good. He was faithful. Now it says at the end of Gideon's life, when he died, guess what happened? The Israelites forgot all the good things that God did through Gideon, and they began to worship Baal. The one that Gideon proved was not even real. And they turned back to doing their own thing, back into the cycle. And guess what? God's still faithful. He's going to keep coming back. He's going to come back and say, I got you. Let me pull you out of the mess you put yourself in. Because he's a good God. Now, I, I want to wrap up with this because I think it's a really clever thing, a really creative thing that happens in the story. If you read, so, so 15,000 of them flee. Okay, we're almost done. This is cool. You'll like this. 15,000 of them flee, and two of the leaders get stopped and get caught. And they know if you kill the leaders, you know, the rest of them are going to stop. So they all flee away. They find these two leaders, and, and it says that Gideon killed the two leaders at two different places, one at the rock and one at the wine press. I say, Chase, I don't know why that's so cool. Where did we start this story last week? Gideon was at the rock when the angel of the Lord came, and he gave him some food, and it said he set it on the rock, and on the rock is where the angel consumed the food. It started at the rock. And where do we find Gideon? Hiding in the wine press. And at the very end of this, because I just think God's so clever, he throws this in there to say they destroyed one of the leaders at the rock and the other leader at the wine press. He said, where it started, I will finish. I called you from here. I I'm going to take you there. And I want you to remember all along the way that it was me. I am a faithful God. So for many of us in the room today, listen, I know I'm talking to you. You've been following God and been trusting God and obeying God, and you're trying to just do this thing called life as a Christian, and I'm so grateful that you're here, and I hope today that you, you can walk away encouraged to just keep on keeping on. Keep trusting God. Keep obeying Him. Keep worshiping Him because He's worthy of it, and it's the best life you can have. Keep on. 
But, but there's other people in the room today, I, I promise there's got to be somebody listening online or, or sitting in this room today that, that you have not taken that first step of faith. You don't have a relationship with, with Jesus. You don't, you don't even know what that looks like. And I'm here to tell you that the best decision you can make before you can follow God and trust God and obey God, you, you need to make him Lord of your life. Jesus, the leader and the Lord of your life. God's word says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's where you put Jesus in the place that he rightfully deserves. And then you can trust and obey and follow and worship. And so I want to encourage someone today. I really feel like as, as I was preparing this that I, I don't normally do this. This is not how we normally do. We're going to close with a, a song talking about how good God is. And I'm just going to stand right here at the front. And, and I'm just going to be here. If, if you feel, for, for whatever reason, maybe, maybe today's the day that, that you need to start that relationship, to begin that step, I'm just going to be right up here. Come forward. I want to I just encourage you to be bold. Step out of the wine press. Come, come down and just, just sit and talk with me. We'll pray together. I got a little gift for you if you want to begin that relationship today and you've never done it. Come find me today. And I believe God wants to just, just transform your life into something incredible. And it may be weird as you follow him, but it's worth it. It's extraordinary. It's, it's not of this world. It's the best life you can live. Let, let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your truth, the story of Gideon, for, for being the same God that you were and that you're the same God today. And that we can look at this story and we, we can see that you are a good and faithful God. And that hasn't changed. Move in our hearts and move in our lives. Help us to trust you more, to, to worship you more, to obey you more, to follow you more, even when things aren't easy, even when things seem strange. Let's do life your way. And God, I just, I just want to pray this specific prayer for there's someone in the room today that, that is not wanting to step forward this morning. They're not wanting to come down because they're fearful, Lord. I want you to give them the strength and the courage and the boldness to come forward. If they need to bring a friend like Gideon had to walk down with them, Lord, I pray that they would do that, Lord. So today they would make that decision that will transform their life. Begin a relationship with you that starts now and lasts forever. I just want to pray over them. Pray that you give them courage. And if they're online, Lord, I pray that they would reach out to someone, one of our hosts, and chat with them. Just say, today I want to do that. I want to know what it's like to follow Jesus. May we honor you with this, for you are a good God.